Maria, and I'm delighted to introduce um, our first expert panel this morning. It's very, um, very briefly to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Thayer Stevens. I'm a coordinator and also visiting lecturer in cultural heritage at the Gloucester School of Art. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our three speakers very, very briefly. So we have Rachel Oppitz, who is a senior lecturer in space in spatial archaeometry at the University of Glasgow and also co-director of the Immersive Experiences Art Lab at Glasgow. Then we have Sophia Merashrafi, who's a digital project officer at Historic Environment Scotland, based at the wonderful Engine Shed in Stirling. And last but not least, we have Chris Walker, who is the founding director of Bright White, a consultancy based in York that specializes in digital innovation, interpretation, and experiential cross-reality exhibitions. So Rachel, would you like to get your slides up for screen share? And Rachel will be talking about how and why we should be thinking about the roles and values and, and ethics in the design of immersive experiences. Thank you, Rachel. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Hopefully you can all see my slides now. So thank you very much to Maria for inviting me to talk today about where immersives fit into my work and their potential roles in archaeological and heritage practice. And I want to talk particularly about where they fit into my wider thinking on how we can and should be intentional in our design of various digital media methods and tools that we use in archaeology and related heritage work and how I think we need to be very careful with the values, aims, and priorities that we can implicitly bake into the everyday tools and infrastructures through our designs of these media. And these general issues are going to be familiar to many of you, but I think there are some specific issues that are raised by immersives, and I want to share my reflections on these in the context of my own work. So my thinking on the design of immersives has really grown out of uh, collaborative work, uh, picking up on Sarah Kenderdite's uh, comment about collaboration with uh, Sarah Perry, Francesca Dolcetti, and Claire Boardman, all of whom are at uh, York and MOLA, uh, Museum of London Archaeology, on how the design of user experiences of diverse digital media and tools both reflects and mediates our aims and objectives and are informed by the content context in which we are working and thinking together about how we can shape our designs of these media to reflect the core values that we want to embed in archaeological and heritage practice. And we all have different foci within this. And my own thinking has really developed out of work across several projects, but notably the Gabi project, where I've been working since 2009, developing digital workflows and infrastructures, infrastructures in the sense of multi-part tools that are meant to support the basic work of these projects. Basically, I build the digital plumbing. And seeing how subtle changes to the design of these digital medias affected really significant social changes in the work of the team using them. So some of my early work at the Gabi project was implementing structure from motion, AKA photogrammetry starting in 2009, and really seeing the knock on effects of the use of this technology over the years and how what started as a tool motivated by the desire for efficiency, we were speed driven, really led us to reconsider why we make records how we are trying to communicate our interpretation and use of data to our peers and a wider public, who is given the opportunity to learn different skills, how much labor we were willing to invest in the creation of the record. So a lot of knock on implications. And similarly, when we introduced a direct to live on the web digital recording with tablets, how something that again was driven by efficiency originally really ended up affecting the staff and junior students uh, junior staff and students' sense of responsibility for the record, uh, senior staff attitudes towards training, and reopened all those debates about who gets to create the record and be that authoritative voice, so kind of echoes of issues around the authorized heritage discourse here. And all of this digital infrastructure work led to a project redesigning our publications and really trying to connect how we as uh, archaeologists worked with our digital data to make interpretations to tell archaeological stories, how we were publishing this data and these stories and making them available. 
seeing things like how simple hyperlinking of text could be used to try to break down knowledge silos between teams uh, via integrating specialist reports. So my work at Gabi got me really interested in these wider social and socio-technical implications of how we design interactions with digital media and tools through these different platforms. And so at this point in my own work, I could see in a naive way that how we design these things includes and excludes people in different positions, is more or less intellectually honest about what we know, points towards openness and communication or obfuscation. And this was the start of my mental connection between what's pretty clearly now, I think, in the public discourse, particularly strongly in the context of AI ethics, about the way we design our interactions with digital tech, reflecting and shaping our values, often in quite subtle ways. And so Sarah Francesca Clare and I ran a session at the CAA conference, Computing Applications in Archaeology in 2018, starting to ask some of the questions about this. And really trying to think, OK, so if our value is to try and respect human experience, are we obligated to make our interfaces delightful, something that's enjoyable to use? How can we connect our respect for human effort to making things that are functional and convenient, you know, kind of making tasks good tasks, making our work be something that is not terrible, uh, which is always one of my aims in life. And around this time, I was working with uh, immersives and my first immersive project happened because I was doing a lot of work with terrestrial laser scanning data and trying to think about how to make this data valuable in an active sense, because like many of my colleagues, I was really frustrated that we were spending lots of money to collect data that mostly sat in the archives for uh, purportedly purposes of digital preservation, but wasn't out there and getting used. I think this is something other speakers are going to pick up today. And I was really interested in how these data could be used to create new knowledge and kind of this nascent sense, uh, again, in my own mind, of preservation by understanding rather than preservation by record. And so this was the first time I encountered really having to explicitly think about value and dilemmas about values that we design into immersives, because immersives make the interpretation of the past more active. I think this is something they're very good at doing and very powerful for. And this means they put people into the past in an active sense, and they're really intended and designed to foreground human experience. And so I was looking at the time at modeling visual attention in representations of past landscapes to try and say something about the experience of them. And because immersive's foreground experience, I think this kind of work really raises a lot of questions as we are designing our work in and with them about if we should be using them to try and persuade people that some aspects of past experience are universal. This is a question on which the jury is still decidedly out or if we should be designing our immersive experiences um, to encourage a sense of presence, or if we need to counterbalance that with a little bit of a whisper of a reminder to suspend belief on occasion. Uh, and so there are lots of separate dilemmas around studying how people engage with immersed experiences. There are very deep implications of using present day behavior to inform our interpretations of the past if we're doing things like eye and uh, movement tracking because of all of the usual issues around representation uh, within the groups we're using to study. So kind of our modern populations involved. So ethical issues related to gathering medically and personally sensitive data about people today, but also I think design assumptions about diversity versus universality in our interpretation of experiences of past places. Separately, I've looked at thinking about using immersives as tools to support interpretation of the present landscape. And so in a separate area, I do a lot of work with airborne LIDAR, airborne laser scanning, and I knew a lot of practitioners had moved their practice to do topographic interpretation of digital terrain models on screen. And so I'd started looking at how we could use the same technology we use to look at the physical landscape and kind of pumps and bumps that represent features, uh, how we could do that interpretive work in digital media. And I was at this point really trying connecting the past two projects to think about uh, the implications for our interpretive practice and looking really at using gesture to uh, indicate what we're seeing in these media. 
um, and rethinking how we communicate our interpretation. So can we communicate what we see in the virtual terrain naturalistically through gesture? And this is really a big move away from the hashers that we had seen previously. So I was looking at widely available tools like Tilt Brush to see how I could, again, paralleling work in Gabi, open up the practice of interpretation to involve uh, a wider group in this process. And so we're really looking in both of my immersive projects at technologies that I think empower more people to do and get involved in the interpretation uh, of our representations of the past. And interestingly with immersives through um, medium, a technology that's really designed to make you feel intimate to make you feel immersed in the representation and to incline your brain a little bit to accept your experiences in it as real, not the thing as real, but your experience as a real and meaningful experience. And so I think there's a real ethical dilemma here as we destabilize the balance of valuing expertise and democratizing interpretation and thinking about how we design interfaces to achieve the right balance between those things in the context of immersion and data intimacy. Um, and also thinking again about how we can make these tasks that are satisfying for the people who are carrying them out. And so hopefully these short examples give you a sense of all the complicated issues that are involved in ethics and values in the design of media intended to persuade and immerse us and which really focus on creating human experiences in the present day and therefore thinking about past human experience. And I just want to say that my own reflections on this sit within a much wider conversation about ethics in uh, extended reality. And I wanted to point all of you towards a great conversation that's happening within the IEEE, uh, led by Ken Bai on the ethics of extended reality. And they are dealing with this enormously complicated landscape of issues. So don't even try to read the slide, all the things that are involved in considerations around the ethics of XR work. And they're asking a lot of questions that I think are really relevant to our thinking. So they say modulating perception and consciousness is a superpower. We are modulating how people perceive the past. We need to be thinking very deeply about this as an issue. How on earth do we ensure that this is a consensual process for people engaging with our representations? They are explicitly asking, I think this is an interesting one, virtual worlds can have public and private spaces. How do we design virtual private spaces to enable those more individual experiences? I think implicitly in a lot of archeology span and heritage work, we're designing for public experience. And again, this is something we really need to be thinking about. They say, be aware of how the stories we tell and the worlds build, we build shape the future. Man, do we know this, right? In archeological and heritage practice, how do we build representations of past worlds that shape the kinds of futures we want from an ethical and value-led sense? So in short, I am trying to ask, how do we make it good? How do we make our use of immersives reflect our values and have the benefits that we want our present day communities to have in diverse ways? And so this is for me, the big challenge in my own work. And so I'm just going to close by saying that we're running a workshop on this in the Immersive Experiences Lab on May 23rd. So on broadly writ ethics of immersives. So if you are interested in this topic, I encourage you to get in touch, sign up for the mailing list and join us. And I am going to stop there and hand it back to our chair. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure that questions will be arising. So this reminder to the audience that you can put your questions in the chat. And at the end of our um, three talks, we're going to be having a panel discussion and Q&A as well. So, um, so we'll now move on to Sophia. So Sophia, if you, um, you know, please do set up your slides for screen share. And Sophia is going to be talking to us about how, um, so about how heritage organisations, for example, Historic Environment Scotland, National Trust for Scotland use virtual environments to tell heritage stories. Thank you so much, Sophia. No, thank you so much, Thea. And thank you, Rachel. That was really fascinating and very thought provoking. I have a lot to think about after that. Um, but I'll jump right in. So what I'll just go through today um, is I'll briefly introduce you to my team, Historic Environment Scotland, and the kind of things that we do uh, before moving on to three examples of sort of the virtual um, and virtual reality ways that uh, 
ways that we use that um, in our work, um, both at Historic Environment Scotland and the National Trust for Scotland, who I work with, and then conclude with some uh, challenges and thoughts that I have about digital heritage and its place going forward um, in the wider heritage sphere. So as mentioned, um, I work for Historic Environment Scotland. For those of you who don't know, it's a body that investigates and cares for Scotland's historic environment. I'm on the digital innovation and digital documentation team, um, which is a small team of people who um, have an umbrella project called the Ray Project, wherein we're working to digitally document all 336 of our properties in care. Um, and all of the objects that they house and this ranges from standing stones to castles and and all of the artifacts that are associated with them, which is a huge undertaking. Um, but what it gives us is this vast library of 3D snapshots in time um, to work with uh, and then use to, to, to tell new stories about our past. This is a, a laser scan of Scarabray you see on the screen. Um, but as, as Rachel pointed out, uh, it's, it's not just having all of that heavy data in the background that's interesting. What's interesting is what you do with that data. Um, so the first case study that I'll bring you to is how we can use the digital and the virtual um, to give access both off, um, off site and on, um, on site, uh, which has been invaluable. Um, in the past year, as I'm sure everyone is aware. Uh, we are big fans of the site called Sketchfab, which is essentially YouTube for 3D models, used a lot by gamers and more and more in the heritage sphere used to showcase everything from coins and pins to entire states. This site, Edinburgh Castle, which is now available for um, annotated tours virtually around the space. Uh, you can uh, jump into virtual reality right on the browser with Sketchfab. So it's a really powerful tool to kind of bring um, sites online and accessible to a, a wider audience. Um, but also we've been able to use these on site during this time through simple quick and dirty QR codes um, for folks moving around the castle um, and other sites that have been opened up slowly over this time uh, to bring in invisible uh, pieces of heritage uh, in, into a more um, accessible way of visualizing it. For example, that Castle Forwell at Edinburgh Castle, which was scanned by lowering someone down into the well, which is a nightmare fuel, but uh, got some incredible scans from it. And you were able to place that into uh, the 3D model of the castle and you can metaphorically plunge down into the depths. Uh, as well as um, a, a bigger library of, of virtual assets, including 360 photography, which gives you um, virtual access to sites um, which have been closed up during the pandemic as well. So really just trying to um, open to as many people as possible um, the places that have been forced to close down. And we're really focusing now on how we can take all these lessons that we were forced to learn over the past year and bring that into the future in a more sustainable um, and uh, applicable way. The next uh, case study that I'll turn our attention to is how the virtual can enhance reality, not only for interpretation, um, but for scientific investigation. This is the Hill House in Helensburgh, uh, one of Charles May McIntosh's work um, dating to the early 20th century, which has been suffering from damp ingress almost from its conception. Um, and we at Historic Environment Scotland have been working with the National Trust, who, or National Trust for Scotland, who look after this property, um, to create digital assets to help inform its, its conservation decisions and care moving forward, uh, working in close collaboration with our uh, conservation science team at the Engine Shed. So you can see here on the left, um, a digital scan, a 3D scan of the Hill House's south elevation in 2019. And then moving across, we're able to use uh, projected on archival images to give you a sense of how it would have looked um, in the 70s as well, and how the facade has changed, and then taking how it's been previously cared for and applying um, thermal imaging as well to try to tell a really rich, complex story of how the Hill House um, has been cared for in the past so that we can inform how it can be cared for in the future and map moisture movement throughout the house using digital technologies in a kind of virtual world so that you can not only visualize it um, the way it, it looks now with color photography and mapping. This is the library, a 3D model of the library, 
um, but also a more holistic view of how moisture can move throughout a space. You can see the dark blue damp of the chimney on the south elevation speaking directly to a dark blue patch in the corner of a room on the inside. And this virtual 3D um, view of how moisture moves throughout the house is, is being used by our conservation scientists and, and architects to inform how to care for the house moving forward. A really exciting project and an invaluable use of the virtual space. And finally, I'll wrap up with a, a proof of concept that we've been working on um, within our organization to uh, promote collaborative working in virtual reality. This is something that I'm personally interested in is vir the virtual can often be uh, associated with quite solitary experiences. You put on a headset and you're alone in this world, um, but really pushing how you can make the virtual, a collaborative experience um, is something that's really fascinating. So this is a, a work in progress where we're working to um, be able to work with uh, members of our team across the directorate, across the country, um, to be able to make quick and fast decisions and efficient uh, conversations about how to care for our properties and care using 3D models and um, in the virtual space, uh, no matter where you are in the country which is very exciting. Uh, I'll close by talking about some of the challenges uh, that I have personally uh, with uh, the virtual. Um, and I think it's always important to remember that uh, the issues with VR and reconstruction um, are, are similar to the issues that you have in the wider heritage and archeological field, but um, can be amplified. And it ranges from everything from uh, virtual reconstruction and the uh, the responsibility we have of articulating that this is a reconstruction um, and not necessarily the absolute truth that we're looking at. This is a, a beautiful reconstruction on the right you see of Bar Hill on the Antonine Wall. Really effective way of bringing a site to life and having people engage with um, the way the past may have looked and may have been. But as you can see on the left, in real life, um, it is what archaeologists lovingly call lumps and bumps. Um, so. It, while it's an incredible way of bringing that site to life, it's also uh, important for us to remember how we have to mitigate um, what you're looking at may not be the exact way that it might have been and how do you communicate that um, efficiently to, to visitors and, and colleagues alike. Uh, there are issues with accessibility, just because something is online does not automatically make it accessible. There are issues that you need to address um, uh, like tenfold when you're dealing with, with the virtual world. Um, and finally, I'll end on the point that the, the longer that I work in digital heritage, the more that I find that the digital should never be the point. It should be used as a tool. Um, the end user and the why should always be there from the very beginning of any project that you're starting to work on. And how we can use these tools of digital documentation, virtual reality, and applications to enhance experiences of heritage for visitors and our colleagues alike is something that all of us um, throughout the industry should be able to, to come together and discuss. Uh, thank you. And if you have any questions about any of those uh, projects, please do get in touch. Thank you so much, Sophia. That was fascinating. Again, incredibly thought provoking. And so now we're going to come on to the third and final speaker for this first panel. So this is Chris Walker who's gonna be sharing examples of immersive storytelling practice and how immersive technologies present new storytelling possibilities. And so Chris, if you could get your slides up, that would be great. Okay. Okay, thank you there. Uh, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Chris Walker. I'm the founding director of um, Bright White Limited. Um, we started in uh, 2004, but I've been working in this field since 1995. Uh, I'm the lead designer for all major projects at Bright White, and um, we spent a lot of that uh, 17 years since we started uh, trying to work out exactly what we do. Sounds like a silly question, but um, we, uh, uh, we, 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 been called and we, we, we said to people that we were interpretive designers and that's okay but that means something very specific to a very small number of people and actually I don't think it does a very good job of communicating and considering that our profession is about communication we were working on improving that. Um, I'm also a trustee of our professional body the Association for Heritage Interpretation and just as a slight aside there linking back to something that Rachel just touched on the AHI has just for the first time in its history 
uh, uh, agreed a code of ethics, which I suggest would be quite interesting to, to this group to have a look. You'll find it on the website, just a AHI code, code of ethics. Uh, and uh, it was certainly within the profession, this, this role of interpretive design is how it's referred to. But we eventually, some time ago, we realized um, that what we actually do is that we help individuals and communities to tell their stories. And so I'd like to take you through a few different projects, not in the order that we created them or built them, but in actually the order that they occurred in history. And the reason for that uh, is that I hope in doing so, uh, it will help to draw out an ethical question and challenge that we're facing. So the, old, the oldest project I'd like to refer to, one hopefully some of you will be familiar with, the Battle of Bannockburn Visitor Centre from the National Trust of Scotland, uh, in partnership with Historic Environment Scotland, Glasgow School of Art, uh, and, and a few others. Uh, uh, but this the community that's being uh, represented here, uh, I think there's probably three, I could argue, the three communities. Firstly and form, foremost, it's the historic historical community of 700 years ago, um, that really created this environment where, um, where they created an independent nation of Scotland. Uh, so the, the historical story as we would know it, um, lead protagonists being Robert Bruce, of course. Um, but secondly, um, about the Bannockburn community um, over the years, they have this asset, this heritage asset, the battlefield that they live near. There's, there's nothing has ever been found on the battlefield. No object can be said to be from the Battle of Bannockburn but you've got this huge battlefield with quite a lot known about where the battle took place. But I'd also argue in this project was uh, representing or telling the story of a community of historians who've kept that story alive over years, interpreting it and reinterpreting it for, for different audiences. So this project launched in 2014, which was to coincide with the um, independence referendum and used a variety of different uh, immersive techniques um, to tell stories. So just go back to the beginning, what visitors see. Uh, they're introduced with a, um, with a 3D stereoscopic theatre production, like, a, uh, uh, like based on a Victorian paper theatre, which sets the scene. It takes you quickly to the point where it explains why there were 30,000 people on a battlefield facing each other with very sharp pieces of metal in their hands. And then next into a, um, a 3D um, stereoscopic immersive environment where although this space is only as big as a badminton court tennis court um, actually it feels like you're in the middle of the field uh, of the middle of a field sorry and 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 here uh, using motion capture uh, the partners at Glasgow School of Art um, help to recreate the uh, some of the battle techniques and, and battle weaponry that was used um, and that's just a slide of the mocap happening at uh, at, um, over, in, over in Glasgow. Uh, but you also met uh, five characters from each side, from five, five from the army of Robert Bruce and five from the army of Edward. And you could ask them questions, fundamental questions, but each one of them had a, an interesting snippet of information to give you that would help you in your, in your mission to win in the battle when you, when you got to the battle table. Um, there was also uh, real objects there so that people, although the content was being delivered in the digital domain, you could go and grab that spear or that piece of armor that you could see in the image and feel its texture, lift it up, feel how much it weighs. But of course, the reason for all of that um, uh, um, early stage in the visit is to get to this place, the, battles, the battle table, which uses uh, LiDAR data and machine cutting processes to recreate a, um, a, an exaggerated Z scale map of the battlefield perimeter and then project down onto that with projection mapping where using straight computer game um, um, real-time tactical 30-person simulator the audience play out their battle of 2014 and then we can compare it at the end to where that is in, re in reference to modern day sterling and of course the interpreter will uh, always finish by uh, contrasting and comparing that and giving the actual story of what happened on the battlefield as best is known by the historians um, uh, in, um, in, uh, in, in in 700 years ago. And that slide there just gives you an idea of the 3D terrain with Stirling Castle there sat on the, on the scarp. 
uh, incredibly engaging for lots of different audiences, multi generational. We've had seen, I've seen witness 90 year olds stood next to seven year olds, both discussing battle tactics there. And uh, the final part, the epilogue, is a return to this stereo. You can just see the hazed image there showing your left and right eye the stereo uh, story of the formation of the declaration of Arbo Arbroath um, in, the, in, the, um, in the epilogue. Lots of different forms of immersion. Um, sort of it's a halfway house, I think, between uh, modern XR techniques and, and traditional exhibitions um, and, and a blend of different media, but predominantly they're about th theatre and participatory theatre. Um, so this project was actually created in 2009 and it's the Bliss, Bliss Hill, the Ironbridge Gorge World Heritage Site, and it was a 360 projection space that uh, had a particular job to do. It had to get visitors from present day back to the Victorian period to remind them that the kind of chocolate box village that they're about to visit at Bliss Hill had these really quite harsh industrial underpinnings, you know, right in the middle of the, or the, the beginning actually, sorry, of the Industrial Revolution. So this space took you in, it had a huge sound system, surrounded you with, with scenes of um, use of um, steam hammers, uh, of the transportation that was there, um, uh, and, 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 and the lifeblood uh, through the World Heritage Site, as they combined sort of coal, uh, iron and steel, um, and I, sorry, coal and iron, uh, to create the, the new bridge, the Iron Bridge, the world's first iron bridge um, there um, in Shropshire. Um, fast forward a bit to um, Second World War and uh, this project uh, completed in 2015 um, is the forever project for the National Holocaust Centre and Museum. Now the person whose stories we're telling here is, is a, of 10 survivors of the Holocaust and now we're getting into a point where the survivors are actually uh, still alive and we can um, not just try and work out what was said or use a historical record, but actually ask them. So this project involved asking each survivor on average a thousand different questions and, uh, uh, in, and then chopping the, uh, the, the, the resulting footage up in, into clips that represented a full answer and then uh, creating a, an installation at the National Holocaust Center where audiences today can go and watch the presentation and, and ask their question and get an answer. Um, slightly further forward in time again for the, uh, not, uh, the, for the Norwich and Oil Museum, the Pioneer Divers, in conjunction with the publication of this book, uh, The North Sea Divers, which um, is a document, uh, documents the story of the uh, pioneer divers from whom important information uh, was withheld about their health of working in deep sea diving. And one of the reasons suggested in the work that the, that information was withheld was that the supply of oil from Norway was so important that in fact it was kept um, uh, um, secret. And a lot of them died and a lot of them still today suffer from terrible respiratory illnesses. Um, so this book really set the record straight, it was funded by the Norwegian government um, and Alongside that book was an exhibition which used um, a, a variety of different immersive techniques here, um, a, a 180 degree um, projected uh, diving simulator, which takes you on an average working trip for, for the divers, just really viscerally and without any kind of written word, uh, just show you exactly what they did and what a weird world it was that they worked in, more akin to kind of space exploration than anything on dry land and that that work was created with the assistance of the living of the divers who survived so all the radio chatter in the diving bell uh, every vi visual reference um, every fact was checked with them at multiple stages throughout so we have the stamp of approval from them that that's a, that's what we're representing is is, is how it was uh, and bringing it to um, the uh, latest project um, that we've completed, uh, funded by Innovate UK. Um, we have worked with the um, music, American musician Niall Rogers to tell his story, and that takes the form of a similar, uh, to, similar to similar to the uh, approach at the National Holocaust Center, where we asked hundreds of questions. Uh, with Niall, we did that and filmed it for specifically for virtual reality, and um, 
uh, this uh, was uh, in conjunction with um, uh, some really advanced uh, research into how to represent a human form in virtual reality. So when you put the headset on, you see in front of you a chair, an empty chair in stereo, uh, really great quality. Niall walks in, comes in, sits down next to you, uh, facing you, and um, you strike up a conversation and you, you can ask him your questions. And uh, so, so that, you know, that and the National Holocaust Centre project, we were never leading Niall to uh, answer a question in a particular way. It's literally a, a process of documentation. So the ethical challenge that I think I'd want to sort of draw out from that is that when we're dealing with living people or even for periods of history where the historical record is detailed and includes quotable utterances mentioned by people, I think the ability for us to be um, completely honest about what we know um, is, is far greater. The, the further we go back in time, the more we have to rely on reconstructions or, or renderings of, of, of characters, start getting into a, a more trickier ethical uh, areas there as well. So, um, yeah, uh, just in summary, um, uh, we were, uh, we're really keen to um, really keen to try and work out a way of, of being able to um, work with historical figures in that way um, in, in, in a more robust way than the artistic representations that, that we get at the moment, um, which comes through film and, and, and TV. And uh, uh, it, that's analogous, I think, to the topic of deep fakes. Because the problem with deep fakes uh, is that uh, you have to realistically represent some the way somebody speaks, what they would say. And that's really hard, actually. That is incredibly hard to do. And you find deep fakes usually very short um, if they're high quality. Um, there's something about the process of looking at deep fake versus authentic capture that I think will give us some clues going forward, thinking about where we're going next, as to how we might be able to uh, portray historical figures for whom we don't have actual utterances and for whom we cannot ask questions uh, as we're interpreting history. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. And I'd now like to invite our speakers to come back together on this Zoom screen for about 20 minutes of panel discussion and also audience Q&A. So audience, if you'd like to put your questions into the chat box and I'll do my best to kind of um, deliver these questions to the speakers as we're going along. But I think just to start off, what really struck me about all your talks was the commonalities and the consonances and, you know, for Rachel putting people into the past in an active way, for Sophia, the end user and the why and how we can use these tools um, to best serve the communities of interest and Chris, you know, this great and very um, very thought-provoking emphasis on communication, how to handle all these things ethically as well. So a very broad question, I guess, just to open up, but what is or has been so far your greatest challenge, do you think, and how did you go about navigating that? So maybe we could start with Rachel. Yeah. So my greatest challenge in this is, I think, figuring out what the values are that I hold and I can speak to myself for a certain extent and my values evolve over time. Uh, but trying to figure out how to do this communally as a collective and come up with even broad agreement about what some of those things are. And I was... Uh, sneaking a look at the uh, AHI uh, ethics code. And it, it's really interesting to see that statement of shared values. And I can only imagine how much time your organization put and how many conversations went into deciding what those core things are. And I think that having a process that is open and positive and inclusive and continues to evolve and lets us continue to mature what we think our values are as a profession, which is really what we're talking about here and also gives us some 
a, a, a forgiving and flexible framework in which we can experiment and take risks, but still have these boundaries uh, that we're setting for ourselves. That that for me is the real challenge is coming up with that. And then, you know, th then the sticky bit happens when we implement designs, right? Mm -hmm. Because we all know that there, there's the design and what we intend to do. And then there's what happens when uh, all of us humans get involved in using the thing. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Rachel. Sophia. Yeah, that's a that was a great answer to that question. I think that um, I'd want to echo the uh, the struggle for the allowance of failure in experimentation. There's often not a lot of space for that. Um, we found in the past year of like um, sort of needing to react yesterday and with very little money to a situation mm -hmm. that we had no control over. Um, the the slow moving machine that is historic environment Scotland had to all of a sudden move very quickly and we kind of thrived on it like there was a lot of really quick emails being like I can do this can you do that um, and the things that we produced together with the interpretation folk and the digital communications folk and the conservation science team um, weren't perfect but they were good and they would have taken years to implement um, and I think that there needs to be found, there needs to be a balance between um, sort of having these new ideas um, and, and allowing them to go through the necessary hoops of a big organization like Historic Environment Scotland. And that's one of the things that I struggle with in the, in, in the, the big machine, um, but also just the ability to, to experiment and to fail um, and to kind of have that flexibility um, is something that I don't have the answer to because I know that like, the hoops are there for a reason, um, but I think that the, there can't be any movement forward unless unless we try. Um, I know that uh, it was mentioned in the keynote that f failure is not an option, but I, I kind of I think that there needs to be a there needs to be something that doesn't work in order to find the things that do. Um, yeah. But it's, it's not easy to find. I think there's such learning. Um, there's such scope for learning through failure as well. You know, it's about, you know, figuring out what does work and what doesn't work, particularly in lines with different communities of interest. And so that's a really, I think, important point as well. How about you, Chris? Such a diverse range of projects and diverse range of communities of interest as well. You know, the big challenges, how you navigated them. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I think with specific to immersive experiences, I think, you know, we have to acknowledge that immersive experiences are extremely powerful. And, and when immersive experiences replace the reality that we're seeing, you have to realize that there's an awful lot of decisions go into what that material is that's replacing your reality. If that's not something that is d documented and if that has got an, the hand of a designer or an artist in it, um, that's where our area has been and we found it most difficult is is being aware of that and looking for uh, acknowledging first that there could be bias in it and secondly removing bias it's a constant one step forward two step back process with it where our whole team are constantly looking at processes and workflows and methodologies to see where the opportunity for bias can creep in because sometimes it can be too late to remove it by, by the end. Um, so that's been a, a sort of a multi-dimensional challenge to our whole practice, really, of, um, of uh, yeah, acknowledging that there's bias, identifying it and removing it. Chris, can I ask, do you think that I, removing bias is possible? <laughs> is surely not identifying and pointing it out sort of the only thing that we can do? Isn't bias just, isn't it just? Where isn't it just the in, in the way that we it's just the water we swim in have you found that you you can actually remove bias completely from a project i think some some projects are have bias at their heart and, and acknowledging that and stating that i think is 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 is, is okay it's the it's the unintended bias i think that, that that really is the problem so you know you you know there are stories that we would tell um that are come from a biased position one one of warfare is is, is is a clear one um but it's it's the the notion that a million different my, micro decisions go together to create a virtual environment um and and who is making those decisions 
and what could they how could they potentially lean that um knowing about it i think is a much harder task than people realize it's really really difficult in a, and the audit of of every decision that's made has meant clawing back through old projects going back a decade in projects and thinking you know yeah we could have we could have been more careful there um and so it was a sort of a professional process i think yeah you acknowledge it identify it um but remove it wherever possible if it's unintended thanks so so much and i guess um riffing off a phrase that you use chris this multi-dimensional aspect and also on what i think sophia mentioned about the kind of way that in an in historic environment of Scotland, the last year has actually meant that things have been almost broken through in terms of that kind of speed of reaction to the possibilities that the current situation presents in terms of reimagining, um, you know, that on um, the idea of the heritage experience. I guess it is the big kind of you know presence in our lives right now. So I was wondering what the three of you would say about. I guess, again, going back to this idea of challenges and how we navigate them, but what possibilities has COVID presented in terms of how we reimagine both tangible and intangible cultural heritage? Yes. Sophia, would you like to go first, given the fact yeah. you brought it up first? Yeah, I could jump in. And um, I know Sophia's thinking about that. We have another question. It's kind of oh, great. from Liz in the chat we can address later. Yeah, go ahead, Sophia, sorry. No, no worries. Um, it is, I struggle to say that like, you know, oh, what amazing opportunities the plague has offered uh, to the world. I don't think that, um, I don't think it will replace, I don't think the digital is here to replace physical sites. I don't think that there is going to be no appetite to go to Stirling Castle in the future. I think that that's, I don't know, I, I'm, I don't think that's like the interesting conversation. I think the interesting conversation is in a state of emergency that virtual has been able to step in and people have been open to that and excited about it um, and sort of how to harness the new internal collaborations within his personally my within my organization mm. um, that have come out of an emergency but how to take those forward into a post-plague landscape um, where we continue to work together and create things quickly and create new ways um, to enhance experience visitor experience on site but also I think it was mentioned about sites that struggle from over um, visiting um, and sort of the uh, climate change aspects to uh, uh, travel and and visitors um, across the world and then tourism how can the digital be um, you know presented to that problem and what what things can we solve with the with the new uh, tools that we've been creating in the past year and 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 further. Um, so I think that there's a lot of um, questions that can be answered by digital and virtual um, that have been kind of compressed uh, in the past year, but it, it's it's exciting. I don't think I don't think it's replacing anything, but I think it should um, continue to to enhance kind of what, what is what is here. Thank you so much. That's a fantastic, and I think absolutely bang on, thought provoking answer. Thank you so much. Rachel, how about you? So I, I'm going to dangerously speculate in a slightly different direction. I think for me, one of the things that's really come out of this period is this impulse, um, partly driven by kind of the speed and the pressure of the COVID situation to build for people the tools that they are saying to us they want right now. I think there's been a very strong drive to re react to kind of user needs and user feedback. And so to, to make people the tools they want. And Sarah Kenderdine's presentation really made me think about this again in that you, were de you designed one of your interfaces without a search where you're kind of forcing people into this browsing mode, which I think is a creative and brilliant solution. Uh, but I also think that if we asked people, do you want to be able to just search most people would probably say yes, because we, we have these gut instinct uh, reactions based on kind of what we know that are currently really driving the design of a lot of things. And so I think that there's a really difficult balance between designing things that are usable for people and are, you know, what people are going to want and allowing ourselves to be closed into the familiar and the now by being very strongly driven by 
this impulse to do do what it is people want and listen to people that are kind of coming out of the culture of this moment. And I I think that, you know, that's something for us to really be thinking about and I find to be both an opportunity and a challenge. How do we take the good of listening to our audiences, but not let it box us into maybe a lack of creativity and not having those really magical solutions that, you know, move us into new areas. Thank you so much. And so we'll now move to Chris and there's a couple of questions coming in from the audience, which we'll move to after that. Yeah, I, I think from disaster, we've had an opportunity to think in more detail and more carefully and over a longer period about digital, well, online interpretation in particular and in online content full stop, really. Um, and, and, and I think I would hope that um, from that, we'll be able to look at what's come out of that and the responses that have come out of that and learn uh, a bit more about remote interpretation. And OK, it's been forcibly remote at the moment for obvious reasons, but there are plenty of people who don't, who can't visit heritage sites for all sorts of different reasons. Um, and, you know, that's that's where we'll be looking. So a slight plug, but it's absolutely an answer to your question. There's a new a new um, award category this year at the AHI Awards, which is lockdown response, asking that exact question. What, what, what have we, as an industry, what have we done that um, we could potentially learn from and take forwards? Thank you so, so much, Chris. And um, so I'm asking a question from one of our speakers from this afternoon. So, hi, thanks for the, um, for the really interesting talks. I just had a question for all of the speakers, but it kind of leads on from Chris Walker's point about deep fakes increasing realism and the implications for, um, for historical figures and topics. What are your hesitations and suggested approaches for this? Chris, maybe we'll leave from you if that's okay. Yeah, I wish I had an answer to that. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I hoped to, rather than present a kind of fait accompli or we've got all the answers uh, presentation to genuinely you know, inform you where we are in our, pro in our process we don't have the answer. What I can tell you is that we're looking at um, the, the uh, way in which deep fakes are created and the, the, um, the, the resource and the skills and the analysis needed to create a, an, a believable deep fake um, as a means of being able to then think of how we might apply that to historical characters, which I think is an interesting area. So deep fake for good reason, not deep fake to try and fool somebody. Mm. Thank you. Rachel, do you have thoughts on this idea of deep fake for a good reason, as Chris says? I think that deep fake for a good reason aligns with what I've been talking about broadly, right? You know, so what, what is it we're trying to do with this technology? So if we start from the basic position that none of these tools or technologies are good or bad within themselves, but it's how we deploy them then maybe there's an imperative for us to look for positive uses for deep fakes because the technology is there. And if we don't find compelling creative uses that are grounded in positive values and our own ethical framework, then the only thing that's out there is going to be uh, perhaps less thoughtful approaches to it. So. I, I think my thought is to try and support Chris, Chris and his work in heading in a positive direction for this, because I think that that's what we can actively do is seek those good uses of these technologies. It's on you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd echo that. I think that, oh, I always think that there is a little bit well, a lot of bit of responsibility um, to articulate, especially when you're dealing with virtual reconstruction, deep fake, to articulate that it is not a real thing that you're looking at. I think that's kind of an issue as virtual reconstructions become more compelling, more believable, um, especially when you're just glancing over it as, as a visitor outside of the field, you can just be like, okay, yes, that's how it was. Um, and there's, I don't know, there's not like, it's not the biggest um, danger in the world um, to think that Bar Hill, for example, looked exactly like that. Um, but I think that there, it is it is something that we do need to keep in mind and there needs to be a, 
there needs to be a way for us to elegantly articulate um, without saying, you know, this is this is false, um, that it is not necessarily um, the capital T truth, um, because that's that's all archaeology is. And I think that sometimes we forget um, that that, you know, that we just assume that people will will look at it and be able to um, know that it isn't necessarily truth that we're looking at. But sometimes, I don't know, we, we perhaps might not. That makes sense. Thank you so much, Sophia. Mm -hmm. And we also have, I think it's more of a comment than a question. Um, so more alternatives to the search engine, please. I think that's, I think that's connecting to one of Rachel's point. And then a very broad um, question from one of our PhD researchers at the University that Glass School of Art. So his question is for all of the speakers, to what extent is the virtual in any way an extension of the material object stroke reality? Or is it a representation removed and replacing the material and the real? Sophia, that's kind of touching towards what you were saying before, I think. Would you like to start, um, start us off there? Yeah, I can give it a try. Um, I think it depends on, um, it depends on how you're handling the material. Um, uh, as we were talking about, I was talking about with the Hill House, there are ways where very obviously um, the model that I'm producing um, is meant to be an extension or, or like a representation with layered on information. Um, but then there are uh, artifacts that we try to scan and try to make as close to as very possible the real image as we can even though that's something that we can never quite achieve. Um, and, it, and it comes with a lot of um, foolery, like we'll make maps for a coin to make it look shiny, to try to articulate the way that the material actually looks in real life. But of course that's me um, in Photoshop, not uh, an, an exact mirror of an object. It's me trying to make it as, as real as possible. So that is still me um, sort of e extending the reality. I don't think it should ever be a replacement, a scan, or a 3D model of a site where an object is just a snapshot in time. It does not conserve it at all. Um, it just creates um, the way it looked on that day when it was when it was scanned or digitized. So I, I should never think that we should go through a replacement of the real. Um, so I suppose, yeah, it, it would it would land on the extension of a reality and what kind of stories we can tell with it um, rather than replacing if Mark that is what you were talking about. Um, <laughs> if, if I completely missed it, do, do pop in the chat, I've, you know. I think that was a great response. And, and, and for reasons of time, I'm actually gonna move us on to um, our final so far question from the audience from Alison Hadfield. So this is in relation to a point that Sophia, um, you raised about digital, re um, digital reconstructions always looking very perfect and sunny. But how do you and our other speakers think they could be made a bit grittier or visceral to represent other sensory experiences of a given place and time? I think we're actually going to go to Chris to start things off. That's OK. Yeah, very two, two seconds on that last question. The mm. big understanding about what virtual reality means, the words, I think the virtues of the thing are carried through into this into this other reality. Um, but to pick that pick that point up, um, yeah, uh, absolutely, completely agree. And this is what I was talking about when I talked about unintended bias. When a when a designer sets, well, watch time of day. Shall we have this 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 visualization set in? Let's make it nice and sunny so that we can always see all the detail. Um, it's it's a decision that's been made which can can color. So uh, I would say research and and an analysis so uh, you know for example with the battlefield map at Bannockburn core samples were taken uh at thousands of different points I can't remember the archaeologist's name forgive me Mr archaeologist who did that uh but um, uh he took hundreds and if not thousands of core samples to work out what the land usage was in in 1314 to create an, an accurate uh map so I think if you look back you can look at weather records you can look at um all sorts of things to try and recreate from um, from from reality, from tr from truth, from record, rather than sort of adding something in on making decisions. I think you will then find it is vis visceral and gritty as we for that. Thank you so much, Chris. And because we have one final question and we've got one minute to go, I'm going to aim this one at Rachel first and foremost. But this is from Rebecca. So the usage of oral history methodology is a central part 
of their PhD research. So I'm particularly interested in the usage of experience, narrative and heritage. Most heritage usage seems to use oral narrative as reconstructive historical representation. But is there a place for analysis so the complications of memory and time perspective of said narrative? Rachel, do you have some thoughts on this? It's a meaty question. Yeah, that, that's a big question to handle in one minute, but I will say that, yes, I think there should be a place for multiple layered stories and for both telling the narrative and having kind of commentary on the narrative, uh, as it were. Um, I think that one of the great possibilities of immersive media is layering these stories on top of one another uh, and having people with more arts-based skills and storytelling skills than I have uh, coming in and taking the work of doing that quite seriously. So uh, this is something we've approached in a very basic way in our work at Gabi by saying, okay, you know, here's the data, we can present the data. Here's an academic narrative, we're gonna layer that on top. Here's a narrative for a public, we're gonna layer that on top. And then hopefully someone coming along and saying, okay, on top of this, you know, for us, archaeological reconstructive representation, right? We have an archaeological reconstructive representation of the past. Someone else being able to come in and analyze how people have remembered that past at different phases in time. I would be thrilled if people came in and did that work on top of our work. So I, I very much hope there's a place for it. Thank you so much, Rachel. And I think yet more validation for the process of working in collaboration as well. So I think we need to finish our first panel there, but I'd really like to thank all of our speakers, Rachel, Sophia and Chris, for a fascinating and thought-provoking start to our day. And shall I hand back to you, Maria, just to kind of do the details? Yes, I'll the do break. a loud, loud clap because it was so nice, <laughs> I think, and it's so diverse. And thank you so much for putting the things in the chat. I know we don't have time to go in great depth in, in all of this, but I think it already highlighted a really interesting way threads for today.